I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. At Freehoffer's Saratoga Jazz Festival, over a beautiful weekend at the Pavilion Grand Hotel, unsung musicians enchanted the audience. The discovery of jazz vocalist Cecile McLaurin Salvant was a rare display of timeless jazz, as profiled in the New Yorker magazine. On stage, Salvant projects confidence and subtle theatricality. Off stage, she's warm, smart, and funny, but also reserved. Her voice more nasal than smoky. Recipient of the Grammy Award for Best Jazz Vocal Album, Salvant's For One to Love was released in 2015. Her latest album, Dreams and Daggers, recorded at the Village Vanguard with the Catalyst Quartet, will be released this fall. The Saratoga Festival was an enticing showcase of novel talent, and I urge you also to check out British South African band Shabaka and the Ancestors, whose creator we hope to host in the coming months. Today is a tantalizing Ella Fitzgerald for the modern age, a scholar and practitioner of jazz whose exhilarating command of, actually communion with, the craft the New York Times praises. Welcome to you. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. It was such a pleasure listening to you at Saratoga. And you told me, minus a, a drummer, you, you were <laughs> immaculate nevertheless. Thank you. Take Thank us you. inside a performance. How did you prepare for that performance? Uh, well, I've been singing with the same band for about three or four years. Uh, and we've done countless tours, uh, been away from home together, traveled together. So it's kind of like a family. Uh, the pianist is Aaron Deal, the bass player is Paul Sakivi, and the drummer is Lawrence Leathers. And so uh, at this point, before a show, a lot of time is spent joking around and kind of getting our minds off what we have to do, which is perform. And then we kind of get into the zone when we get on stage. Um, yeah, we've, we've, we've had a really, really great run as a band. What is the zone for you? Is it a zen-like state? We've had artists here who describe it that way as some kind of catharsis, but what is it to you? For me, it's like an emptiness. It's like becoming the sound that you're creating. Um, it's almost like losing your body and losing who you are and just fully becoming that sound, becoming that moment, that story, uh, letting that take over you and letting the communication with the audience take over. So it's like an emptiness. It's like I don't exist anymore. To the audience, you most definitely exist and <laughs> shine in a way I hadn't heard since my grandfather, original host of this show, <laughs> introduced me to Ella Fitzgerald. Do you derive you. inspiration from Ella, who I think recently celebrated an anniversary of her yeah, birth? Yeah, 100 years. Um, I absolutely love Ella. Ella was uh, the singer that I learned so many standards through. When I first uh, started singing jazz in France when I was 17 years old, she was the one I listened to. Those were all the definitive versions. And her diction is impeccable, improvisation is amazing, her rhythm, I mean, and just such a joyful performer. So yeah, Ella was, was one of them among many, many. Because the great thing about jazz is that through uh, maybe a century of music, there were so many incredible artists, geniuses, people who each had a really specific voice. Uh, and it's, it's really fascinating and, and exciting to delve into that. You add humor to that. Uh, is there a particular artist that has influenced your rendition of jazz combined with a humorous outlook on the world? Uh, I'm not sure it's one particular artist. I do love to laugh. I love comedians. I love stand-up comedy. Um, and I also love kind of the tradition in American entertainment of having music and humor uh, and comedy be put together, you know, going back to vaudeville days. Um, of course, one of my favorite performers is Burt Williams, who was an amazing comedian. Uh, and he was a black man who wore blackface, which is so crazy to us today. But, but this was something that was done quite often. And he was one of the most famous and loved entertainers of his time. And he was very um, torn by doing this, but also very funny. Um, of course, Fats Waller is another one that I think of, just a hilarious singer, pianist, composer. 
uh, always making jokes and yet at the same time playing this incredible music. And it goes on and on. I mean, you can find hints of humor here and there in a lot of standards. Like if you think about some of Cole Porter's uh, classic songs, a lot of them are really funny. Well, you're making your mark on this great American songbook. And I, as I said in the intro, there is a riff you do in your concert <laughs> that is mind-bogglingly funny. <laughs> Thank you. At the same time, sensual, soulful, with a lot of rhythm and blues. <laughs> um, but th folks have to go to the concert to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can give a preview. It is, it's kind of like the shapes of humanity <laughs> and the evolution of those shapes from bit, birth yeah. to a little bit, Death? yeah, <laughs> I guess so. Uh, that's a beautiful way of putting it. It's actually, I think the song um, that we laugh the most, I mean, one of the songs that, that we really have a good time with is called The Ballad of the Shape of Things. And it's sort of about adultery and a woman who um, takes revenge uh, in whatever way you might imagine. And it's kind of just really, it builds to this kind of funny climax and uh, it's one of the songs I love to sing. There are a lot of songs also, these like early blues from like the 20s that have a lot of innuendo because you know they were made in such a way that they could be played on the radio but it's just there's a, it's, it's some intense lyrics, intense messages and they're funny and so I don't know I think it's important in life but also in art to be able to laugh uh, and you can get a lot of interesting messages across when you when you say them with a laugh and when people laugh at them dreams and daggers mm. yeah enchant yeah. us more dreams and daggers is the upcoming album uh, i'm really excited about it um it's a double album so there are 21 songs i believe uh part of it was recorded live at the village vanguard with my band part of it was recorded in a studio in new york with a string quartet. Um, there's some original compositions, there's some old vaudeville songs, there's some jazz standards, there's some French songs, um, there's some Langston Hughes in there. Um, it's, it's a really a, a mix of all the, all the things that I love that are important to me and uh, always showcasing the sound of the band that, um, that's been with me for, for the past four years. I was amazed at how prolific you were. Are you producing a second track, a second disc of nearly two dozen songs because you haven't, you didn't make a CD in 2016, so you're going from 2015 and you <laughs> felt like in 2017 you had to double down? Well, it's, um, I don't know if it's because we didn't record in 2016. I think it's Every time we record, we end up recording 20 tracks, like even in 15, uh -huh. even in 13 when I recorded. Um, it always ends up being about between 18 and 20 tracks. And we always have to, you know, dial it down and pick 12 out of those or 10 out of those. And it's always like so difficult to choose. And this time we were performing live. We had two sets a night. Uh, for three nights we recorded. So that's so much music, you know. So we had maybe we recorded maybe 30 40 songs so we already narrowed it down to get to those to those 15 that were live and then the five in studio with the or the six in studio with the string quartet to synopsize put dreams and daggers in contemporary relevance why dreams why daggers mm -hmm. well i was I was fascinated with the idea of a dream, like a dream that you have at night when you're sleeping, you know, and the whole idea of slipping into another world uh, and how that's still linked to your waking life. Uh, but also the idea of a dream as, as a hope. Um, and so those songs explore those two elements of dreams. And the daggers, to me, um, it was taken from one of the lyrics in the song in one of the songs I wrote, but a dagger to me is something that you can use against others, but also against yourself and as a defense or as an attack. And so the idea of uh, the songs that I sing as being both political songs, songs about identity, songs about self-worth, about um, 
self-hatred, self-love, all of those things are kind of comprised in the idea of dreams and daggers. Wow. You said to the New Yorker in what was a scintillating review, which you haven't read yet, <laughs> um, but you did tweet it, uh, in a phone conversation with the author of the New Yorker story after the presidential election, you said that the current political landscape is making me feel that I want to be messier, sing more political songs, write more political songs. And this was after you had just given a lecture on the history of race and women in popular culture in upstate New York. Um, how do you think that was integrated into this album? And how are you, you probably already recorded some of what's in the 2017 album, but what is more political messier look like? It looks like really talking about questions. I mean, I think for, for me, political is, is a certain word and it has a certain weight to it. But beyond that, really getting down to the idea of identity, because I think identity is really something that shapes politics a lot. And um, the idea of what it means to be an American person today, a black person in America, a woman in America. Uh, all of these things are very fascinating to me. There are a lot of questions that I have. And so delving into those questions more through my music is very important to me and is really where my heart's at right now. Rather than singing, you know, love songs about, you know, a lost love, for me, singing a love song that also has this undercurrent of like this tension of like, what does it mean to be a human? What does it mean to be who I am today? And what weight do I have to carry with those things? Um, I, I think that's important. And I, and, you know, I think about somebody like Solange, who just came out with her record, A Seat at the Table. Uh, I think that came out last year. Uh, which was such a striking album to me because it was so political. And I think, I think it's in the air. I think people are really delving into that musically. I think about D'Angelo, Kendrick Lamar. Um, it really excites me to see music come out like that. And this is the music that excites me to sing too. Bravo, brava, because when we had Ninth Wonder, the hip hop professor and DJ here, who's produced for Kendrick Lamar and Jay-Z, he was expressing the same a shared sentiment of there's nothing wrong with explicit or implicitly political speech, expressions of political identity or sentiment in music. And it, it, we agreed that until recent months and years, there had been maybe a, a shyness that grew in the ranks of Hollywood and there was a void and it was being filled now by the likes of, of you, Cecile, and uh, Chance the Rapper. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, but it, it is exciting to hear from you that candor and openness about purpose. Yeah, I it, think I mean, it's, it's just more than laudable because in application you're you're moving people with the sound and the voice. I mean, you know, it's to me, it's just. I think music is an expression of who I am and it's just a, it's an extension of it. And so I sing things that I think about, things that I feel and things, you know, things that I would talk about in life. So it's, it's not that I do it on purpose or that it's artificial. It's just, these are the things that are on my mind. These are the things that interest me and excite me. And this is what I want to share with people. And you're free to riff at any point if you want to, to give our viewers a taste, but okay. no, no <laughs> pressure. Uh, I, 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 we didn't discuss beforehand. It's so organic in exchange that we didn't talk about whether you wanted to riff from on shapes. But if you do, you're, you're welcome to. Uh, and I'd love to hear it. In the meantime, though, I wanted to just from this New York Times review, give our viewers a sense of, of your voice. When the New York Times reviewed you, they said you are in communion with the craft, the way you listen, supple, well-trained voice with spot-on pitch. Uh, her low notes go from husky to full-bodied. Her high notes float purely and cleanly. When she scats, it's not an ego trip, but a musical game where notes and syllables get to shape shift shapes back to shapes <laughs> that's sweet that's a really nice uh quote thank you <laughs> well thank the new york times and <laughs> I, I guess you can thank us too but um 
when you think of the history, because you study and lecture on jazz, um, what do you hope to revive in the contemporary culture that may be may have disappeared or or may not be as visible anymore? When you think mm. about Smokey and Ella, is there something that they possessed and imparted that we can recreate for the next generation? I don't know what I hope to revive, but these are the things that interest me in life. Um, I like human things. I like handmade things. I like things where you can feel the touch of a human being. This is why I love acoustic music. I love instruments. I love being able to have that immediate connection, which we cannot have behind a screen. Uh, so this is why the, you know, the idea of live performance with acoustic instruments, with a certain amount of error, human error is something that's really interesting to me and really important to me. Uh, and I think it's in, important to a lot of people. You see it in food too. You know, a lot of people are getting interested in cooking again and going to the market and getting organic things. And I feel like I wanna feel that in music and culture as well. And I think it's, it's needed. So there is a comeback in the works uh, I don't know, but I'm hoping. A <laughs> comeback so. of certain things. Of certain, of certain fundamental ideas, of, of certain ideas of, you know, coming back to simpler things and coming back to, to communion with, with, with people, uh, actual people, not, you know. Emojis or exactly. bots. I think, it's, it's, I think we have to inevit inevitably get to that because we're moving so far in one direction of just like being individualistic and being behind our screens that I think when people do go see a live show and when people do go um, have a home cooked meal somewhere that they, they really, they feel it and they appreciate it and they realize that it's, it's part of being human. When you hear other performers uh, in the live setting, I was asking you before where your favorite place is to perform. Do you absorb something that is more than transitory? Because that's what I always ask artists who are on this show. How can that musical power expand into hearts and minds mm. and retain the organic quality you describe mm. during a film shoot or a live concert, but then be embedded yeah. in our soul or consciousness. Is there any guidance you would give us on that? That's very interesting. You know, I think I was, I was talking to a pianist, a friend about this. Um, the idea that music is fleeting, just like life, just like anything, is such a beautiful and precious thing. And I do like the idea that you can go see a live performance and then it's done, it's over. And all you have is your memory of it which is fading. And that's, that's an extremely important thing for us to remember and to have and to live with, the idea of everything being fleeting and ephemeral. And I think music has lost its quality because we've recorded it, because we go to gigs and we record the gigs so we can keep it because we wanna keep it. But I think the beautiful thing is that we don't, we can't keep it, we can't touch it and we can't hold on to it. It just, it happens and then it's over. You know, and I think that's beautiful. And, and what would be your hope that in a political fashion, that an alliance of artists of your ilk would band together and form not a political party, but <laughs> some kind of meaningful discourse that can be constructed and reconstructed for posterity so that the politics of music, the, because the politics of music mm. may mm. ought not be mm. fleeting. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, it's, it's the whole idea of the thing itself goes away, but it leaves you. There's a residue, right? There's something that it leaves you with. There's an impression, and the impression is more important than whatever thing itself is, you know? Um, and I think, I think the mere idea that music is outside, in a way, of the political realm, but still very much linked to it, is important. It's an important thing for people to have this kind of transcendental 
art form moment where you can get out of your daily frustrations, get out of whatever, you know, political landscape is today and kind of get more involved and in touch with what it means to be a human being in a society with people. Uh, I think that's really important. If we think of landmarks, milestones in music history where that social consciousness was galvanized, I want to hear what you think, but you think of Michael Jackson and company, celebrities, We Are the World, and you think of Will I Am, Yes We Can. Mm, yeah. W to your mind, what are those kind of triumphant moments where the history, the history was dictated in some way by the music as much yeah. as the music being dictated by the history? And, and do you have hope that in a, a culture that is so desensitized and numb to every movement because of the millisecond yeah. media that we can create anew that kind of politically charged moment again through music? Uh, one of the things I think of a lot, this is going further back, is Abby Lincoln, uh, who worked, she was a wonderful jazz singer. She worked with Max Roach, who was a great jazz drummer. And they did something called the Freedom Now Suite. And she is screaming, this is in the 60s, she is just incredible and talking about being black, being African, and, and retribution and all kinds of like really intense kind of, you know, almost off-putting, I imagine, to some people, messages. And that bravery is something that I always look back on. Of course, I think of Nina Simone as well. Um, I think, I think we're in a different time and I think, I think we're going to just have to figure out another way of reaching people, of doing that. Um, we're in a time when, yeah, when I feel like a lot of the, the people in the generation below, I guess I don't know what I am. I've heard I was Me a too. millennial, but I don't know, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm like on We're old cusp. school now. We're, we're, we're old school millennials. Yeah. <laughs> If, if that. If that. But I feel like the people coming, you know, people coming up, 18-year-olds, 20-year-olds that I That's see a are... They're different beasts. They're different beasts, <laughs> completely. But they're super, they're super politically charged. They're really open. They're really... Ta like, all of the ones that I meet are really, you know, I feel like, like I'm, like, super old school <laughs> when I talk to them in terms of just openness and acceptance of people. And so I think, I think we're, we're going in a, in a good direction in that sense. And I think, I think music is, is accompanying that. You know, I see even somebody like Tyler, the creator, who just came out with an album and addressing things like homophobia on his album as a rapper, that's something that 20 years ago, I don't know, like I'm not sure that some, a famous rapper like him would have come out with an album like that. So I think we're... I think music is still, it's still sh having those messages. It's just packaged in a different way. It's just getting to people in a different way. And that's kind of disorienting for me, definitely. For me too. <laughs> but we see forward progress. I think so. The hope, even as it's a community today, a new generation that socializes digitally, almost exclusively, Yeah. Um, what's next for you? What are you anticipating for the tour of this Dreams and Daggers album? What do you hope to accomplish in this tour that you might not have in prior tours? Uh, coming up next, we're gonna be performing a little bit in the United States. We're going to play at the Hollywood Bowl uh, opening for Brian Ferry. Um, then we're going to go tour in Europe. Um, I'm really excited for this tour, but it's going to be just, it's just going to be us playing like we usually do. Nothing too dramatically different. Um, just like a family reunion kind of, because I haven't been performing with my band too much lately. So it'll be sort of, yeah, reunion vibes. And then next year, 
which is something that I'm working on now, uh, I'm going to perform this sort of song cycle, cantata, jazz cantata, I'm not sure what you can call it, uh, about an ogress. So I'm writing all the music for that now. And so that's kind of going to be the new venture into, you know, un <laughs> undiscovered lands. So we'll see if that even works. But I'm excited I'm excited to alternate between familiar things and completely scary, new, maybe failure things, too. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Cecile. Thank you very much. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful and soulful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and to the corporate community, Mutual of America.